since uh, you all know that I've been involved in working for Mumia for years and years and years, and I went to uh, Venezuela two weeks ago uh, to represent the Mumia movement. Specifically, Pam was thrilled about my going, and Mumia uh, recorded a special, special message, which we're going to hear in a minute. And he had already recorded something just a few weeks earlier I don't know how many of you were at that demonstration in Washington, D.C. Lillian, you were there, weren't you? Didn't you say you were there? Were you at the yeah. demonstration? Well, Mia wrote, sent a message for that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful message on um, why Venezuela should not agree to the U.S. taking this over. Mm -hmm. And he uses the example of Puerto Rico. Look at what Puerto Rico has been as a colony. Look at the... So he wrote that. He sent that message out back about two months ago by now. And then he did, on my, I got the message on my way to, uh, I think at the airport, his message was sent for this next one. So we're going to start. So I want to say a little bit about why, why I was so thrilled to go this time, and every time I've gone, and why Pam was so thrilled that I was going. Because our feeling was that the Mumia movement, given Mumia's politics, given the movement that we have, should be there in solidarity with Venezuela at this moment. That that's our responsibility. And that, uh, you know, obviously we're not a single issue movement, but that to be there at this moment was very, very special. And um, it was quite amazing being there at this moment because people were so appreciative. And we were hugged and kissed and treated like, you know, uh, Sa not saviors, but but um, comrades, 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 really comrades, and in tremendous appreciation for our being there. And you'll see some of the. And of course, as an older person, I was I was treated like the queen, queen of England. <laughs> <laughs> I could barely walk. <clears throat> Finally, someone turned to me, one of the people who was being kind of taking care of me. She said, "You know, you have more energy than I do. I'm gonna stop." <laughs> So um, it was kind of funny, uh, but very sweet, very touching. And um, right now, the people in the embassy in Washington, you can just imagine how much the Venezuelan people appreciate them. When um, right before I left uh, New York <coughs> about three weeks ago, uh, how many of you have heard um, Jorge Arias speak? He's the foreign minister. He's kind of the hip, young looking. He looks younger than he is. <clears throat> but he's very, very smart, very sharp. And he spoke at the Phil, at the, not the Phil Forum, what's it called? The, the new Forum, Give me on 38th the Street. Forum. The People's Forum. <clears throat> and he specifically uh, asked for us to look at the video of the embassy people. And he kept saying, you know, he was speaking specifically to, what's her name from Code Pink? Medea. He says, Medea, are you there? You know, and really appreciating it and making it very clear <clears throat> that they had the support of the Venezuelan government in being there. And since this was the embassy of the Venezuelan government, you know, that they were there so that anything they did, like arresting them they did this morning, which was completely illegal and so on and so on, uh, was something they would take very seriously. So I don't know what they're going to do. They're definitely trying not to be provocative. It was the Venezuelans are trying not to be, what'd you say? It was her size exactly the same. Yeah, the sign, the sign of them being arrested, you mean? Yeah. And the insanity, I don't know how many of you saw the letter <coughs> that the that was delivered to the people who were sitting in. The letter had no letterhead, no signature, and said, you are hereby ordered to leave the embassy. With no, I mean, it was like completely crazy. Not only do they not have any legal basis, but they send this stupid letter. And the letter that was with the response <coughs> from the sitting was, uh, what's her name, Mara? I, I can't remember her name. She, you know her, right? Mara Van Hillier? Yes. She's the lawyer for the People City. Brilliant response. <laughs> you know, the difference was incredible. Brilliant response. This is a violation of international law, of Washington, D.C. law, of everything. She listed every single thing. It's very, very strong. Very strong. 
Anyway, <clears throat> so with that as an introduction and appreciating, and tonight we're really dedicating to those sitting sit ins people. And as many people as can go on Saturday, there's a caravan going and so on and so on. Um, but I thought we should start with the message from Mumia that he sent with me <laughs> to bring to Venezuela. So um, John is going to play that for us. It's short, of course. Bolivarians, the liberational spirit that moved the late Hugo Chavez as he rebuked U.S. imperial interference into his country, an interference which continues to this day to dog the steps of President Nicolas Maduro, Chavez's successor. The U.S. government, led by perhaps the most openly racist administration in modern history, certainly memory. Who can forget President Trump launching his campaign by calling Mexican immigrants rapists and murderers, for example? Cares not a fig about Venezuela's people. They care about Venezuela because it has the world's largest sea of underground crude oil reserves. The U.S. wanted to own or control it. That's why they want their chosen puppet in power. If the U.S. government doesn't give a damn about its own Latin Americans here, the Latino citizens like Puerto Ricans, for example, and it doesn't, what makes you think they care about Venezuelans. Simon Bolivar fought for America del Sur from not only its Spanish control, but they wanted what? Independence. Do you think he wanted his country to be a puppet of the Americans in the North? Should the sons and daughters of Bolivar bend their knees to the greedy, fat Yankees? Of course not. They are resisting, just as they did under recent U.S. coup attempts against Chavez. When Chavez was first seized by U.S. imperial puppets, the people of Caracas spilled into the streets to demand his freedom and won. This is an attempted coup against Maduro to stifle a revolutionary people who, like Bolivar, want to be truly independent of imperial power. Todo poder al pueblo de Venezuela. All power to the people of Venezuela. Por existencia, por independencia, por libertad desde gringos. Todo poder al pueblo de Venezuela all power to the people of Venezuela. Desde Nación y Garcela, soy Mumia Abu Jamal. <laughs> so the last time, no, not last time, two, two visits ago when I was in Venezuela, it had been, it was actually Chavez's Chavez last year on this earth. Wow. And I happened to be there, and so were you, uh, for his birthday. That was his last birthday. And <clears throat> Mumia had sent a message. I mean, they, we've had this long relationship in Venezuela. Mumia had sent a message wishing him happy birthday. Mm -hmm. And start, you know, the, the, the major media is controlled by the right wing. But public radio, anything to do with the government, was controlled, of course, by the government. So starting 8 o'clock in the morning on Chavez's birthday, Mumia's birthday greetings was played all day long. Oh, how wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that because people don't get to know these stories. Right. And it's one of the special, special things. Okay, so um, 
for those of you who didn't find out before, William has not been able to get out of uh, Venezuela. He's stuck there, he hasn't been able to get a flight, he's been trying for several days. And instead, at about 7.30, uh, Mark Cook is going to come. And Mark Cook is someone who's working um, with fairness and accuracy. He's a very knowledgeable person, done a lot of research, and speaks Spanish fluently. And on our delegation was really the spokesperson often for the whole group because he was so clear and communicative. And also, we have a surprise coming, which is not going to be a surprise anymore since I'm announcing it, William's going to call a little after 7 o'clock because he couldn't be here. So uh, everybody's here. In the meantime, I'll hold the fort the best I can. And um, I will start by saying what this trip, this particular moment in Venezuela was like. So um, when, I, when we got there, um, one of the first things William told us was I, I came two days later because I was at the I didn't want to miss the demonstration for Mumia in Philly on the 27th, so I left on the 28th. And when I got there, uh, William said that the next day we're all going to be going to a housing conference. And my joke is I've told some of you is that some of the people on the trip there's always like the insanity of a colonial mentality, <laughs> you know. So these are all good people. Our trip was wonderful people, but. <clears throat> Two people began complaining right away how we could, why are we going to a housing conference? We want to see the people. We want to be with the people. And <laughs> acting as though the conference, which was led by the party and led by all the progressive forces, was not the people. <clears throat> and in fact, the conference was amazing. It was more than, I, I sat in that conference from 9 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. And I'm not the type to sit still like that. And it was amazing. So let me start by telling you a little bit about this conference. And you can stop me at any point. So he had this t-shirt. Is a Venezuela, is the housing conference t-shirt, the official logo and the t-shirt. And uh, the Gran Mission Vivienda Venezuela means uh, Chavez, when he came into office, um, established four what they call mission, missions. And one was for food, for the production of food, which pr guaranteed that everybody got food. The other was health, which the Cubans came and set up. The third was housing. And the fourth was, I'm forgetting. I'll try to remember. I always forget one. Healthcare. So there was health care, the one I said the Cubans did, set up for them. There's housing, education, education, education. education. So those were the yeah, four missions. So in 2011, and the housing, the first, I went, the first time I went to Venezuela was about 10 years ago, a little more, and the housing was all on the hills, shanty towns. It was really looked pretty bad, and also took about two hours for people to get to work. And back. I mean, an hour each. It was like very, very hard to walk on these cobblestones up and down hills. Um, within a sh by the time I came back the second time, there was um, these cable cars that, that they had going up. And each one was named you know, after somebody, revolutionary, Che Guevara. There's a beautiful, beautiful trains going up, which saved the people. It was a tremendous, tremendous contribution to the lives of people going to work. You know, That kind of, could you imagine if they tried to figure out something progressive in this country? that didn't have people driving in cars for two hours and sitting, you know, I just listened to that and I, it's hard to believe. At any rate, that was one of the accomplishments of that, that uh, Chavez had done at that time. But he also announced that um, they were going to build, the goal was to build um, by this year was going to be two million housing, new housing units. So this is quite a while back. This was 2011, I think, when they announced it. Yeah, when the housing mission was established was 2011. They announced that they were going to do this, these units. Now, I've been hearing about this for some time. So they've actually built in this period of time. And remember, this is when they're being, when the president, Maduro, has, there was an assassination attempt, when there's constant 
challenges to them militarily, threats, etc., and boycott, everything that's going on, they build 2.6 million housing units. Wow. 2.6 million housing units. And that's not just for one person, that's like for a family. And um, so they exceeded the goal. And so the people were ecstatic. The, so this, this is this bureaucratic housing conference that people don't want to go to. And there's music and dancing and just complete joy over this accomplishment. And the guy who was um, head, who's head of that mission spoke long time, kept speaking, and other people from around the world, including Chile and so Latin America from South Africa, were all saying, Venezuela has become the model of how to expand housing for the people. So again, you have to always keep this in mind. That's in this period. In this period, they're able to do that. So one of the themes that came up again and again, and Maduro gave it on May 1st, and the head of the mission gave it, and was, this came up again and again. On the one hand, we defend our homeland. On the other hand, we build socialism. And we don't stop one because of the other. And so that is the theme. That's what you come out of, and that's what you begin to realize very quickly, that they are serious about building socialism, even in this period. And um, on May 1st, Maduro talked about, um, you know, we can't say that we don't have enough resources. We have to find new ones. If the ones, if they're going to keep some of the, um, if they're going to keep some of the materials from us that we need, we have to create new materials. We have to have new resources. We cannot stop. The building of socialism requires constantly developing new technology, new whatever to deal with. Uh, with what's going on. Of course, the Cuban model is an important model. People remember back when Cuba was making all these cars that looked like contraption out of a museum where they would have one part from this old car and another part from something else. And that's how the Cubans survived. And um, the Venezuelans are trying to figure out how to do a lot of it. One of the things I noticed was that there was less pollution. The city was more, less polluted because they're not producing as many cars. So, you know, there's a mix, but I thought it was kind of a nice thing. The city looked never more beautiful. This is my fourth time going there, and I was really struck uh, by how beautiful it was. Um, so that was the, the housing thing. Let's see if that's... No, yes, that's, that's quite you. beautiful. Okay. Hola, William. William? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I have you on speaker. Yeah, I can hear you, but you're going to have to speak a little louder so other people can hear you. Okay? People can hear me? People can hear you? Yes. Well, yeah. well, hola, William. This is Jerry. That was Jerry Gregg speaking. Okay, anybody else want to say something to William? No. no? Okay, everybody wants to hear from you. Yeah. They were going to feel very cheated if you didn't call. Okay? William. William, I think he may have moved somewhere. It's still open. It's still open. Yeah. William? Not lost the connection. Oh, oh you're here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you want to tell us something? Oh, okay. So you want to say something? about what's happening in Venezuela or what's happening in Washington or anything you want to say? Everybody can hear from me because I'm a little difficult for people to hear me. Everybody can hear you. We can do hear? I do. Everybody can hear you. Okay. Yes. So let me say something. Okay, let me say a few things. Um, I have been and uh, driving to different states. I was in Valencia and I was in Yaracuy. Also, I was in Guarico. So, I have been finding uh, things that are very, uh, that make me feel worried. One well, of the things is that the, all those states have, they, those states have blackout every day. The high is about six hours per day, at minimum. So, Asia, a different part of the city of Valencia, a different part of the state of Carabobo, a different part of the state of Yaracuy, and why of the light is on several times per day in different parts of the state. And that's happening in several states in Venezuela. It's happening in Zulia, that is one of the biggest states and very well 
the damage that was caused to the system would take maybe minimum a year. That's one thing. Everybody's hearing what I'm saying? Yes, yes, everybody's listening very eagerly. Okay, that, that's one problem. The other problem that I've been finding, uh, of course, is sent to the Black Town and the Ajab and everything that happened in the South uh, to the to the electricity system. So they have been successful. They have been the opposition in the United States have been successful. They successfully damaged part of the electricity system of the country. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there's something to me to be worried. Is that, um, people are having trouble with water. So it's no water when you don't have electricity, you have two more two additional problems. No water and no cell phone. No any uh, I was yesterday in Valencia completely disconnected. I wasn't able to call anyone, I wasn't able to receive call, to receive text messages, not only in Venezuela, you know, not in Venezuela and whatever. You know, you have no access to the internet, you don't have access to your cell phone, you don't have access to communication, and you don't have water. No trip probably are happening in those states that visit and what I understand and those probably are also happening in those states that are, that are facing electric problems. But it is probably is the gas. People are having trouble to get gas to their house too. Oh so it's, it's a very difficult for a lot of people to get a, a gas for the for the kitchen and and sometimes they they spend uh, days without gas. And that's another problem that may lie for the people here very difficult. But another problem, additional problem that is something new that is you may be surprised, probably if some of you are going to be surprised, is that there is no gasoline. People are in horrible lines to get gasoline because to make gasoline in Venezuela need to some chemicals that is right now very difficult for the Venezuelan state, for PDVSA, for the oil industry, to get those chemicals sent to USA. So you will see huge lines every day to the gas station of very cost, very cost, very cost. There is no enough gasoline in the country. Basically today I was in a line, big line, uh, so I get home when I was getting my gasoline, the light went out. So we have a blackout and the guy said to me, hey, I cannot do anything else because we, we don't have light, the pump is not working anymore. So, so the light will be back maybe in six hours. So I wasn't able to get enough gasoline from the car. So, uh, those things are happening all over the country, except in uh, Caracas, they are trying not to. The, the impact in Caracas is, uh, is minor, but in the countryside is affected. Uh, and the border is also extremely affected, the border with Colombia is extremely affected. Um, also, it, 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 there is a huge problem in the as uh, two years ago happened, we, no, we don't have any more cash. We don't have Venezuelan currency, actually, because all the cash is used to buy, you know, the moment block, yeah, they got all the Venezuelan cash. It's a very, very evil system that has been created through the dollar and through the Bolivar, the Colombia, so the currency for Colombia, and it's, it's to, to destroy the Venezuelan currency and to make possible for Colombia to get enough gasoline to to produce cocaine. As you know, to produce a, a kilo of cocaine, you need 35 liters of gasoline. So Colombia is spending the amount of cocaine producing uh, uh, annually. They are spending more than 40, uh, something like 46 million liters of gasoline that is, they are getting from Venezuela. So it's, 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 this is the panorama internally. The economy warfare is very tough, it's very aggressive, 
them as very perverse and as they try to destroy the willing of the Venezuelan people. And one side, when you see all that panorama, that, all that picture that is very, I would say, sinister, it's very horrible, despite that, and I was surprised to see that people act very like, normal, that nothing is happening, I was surprised. Just to, to let you know, in Venezuela, we never had that kind of problem. We never had problem with the gas of flame. We never had problem with electricity. We never had problem, rarely we have problem with the water system. So those, we never face those problems. And those problems, people are facing those problems every day. So, and, 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 and to see that people are reacting like something normal, that they don't get angry, they're not talking about it. They just, I just was last day in, in, in Carabobo, in Valencia, and I was, I was surprised, I was angry, and I was surprised to see that everybody said, oh, let's get a beer, because there are some cold, cold beers, still there are some cold beers, and forget about the life, because that's, the life will be back in maybe in six hours. <laughs> so, so it was very, very, to see that kind of reaction from the people, from Venezuelan people, was, uh, for me, was very positive. But at the same time, I don't know how much people are going to tolerate what's going on right now. Uh, people are angry because the government is still, you know, they, most of the people think that why don't you be a jail? Most of the people think that some of the people that can't make the electricity should be a jail. So, so already several have been put in jail, but some of them are not in jail. And, and, they, and, and, and a lot of people think that it's, that is a weakness for Maduro, because they feel that why don't you be already in jail. Um, people are scared because they, they, they think that something will happen anytime. The United States could organize something against Venezuela, do something from Provo. A military situation in Venezuela. But despite that, everything is normal. Despite, you know, people go to the school, people go to work, and then, you know, all this uh, conflict, daily challenge that people are facing, uh, people try to have normal life. That's basically what can I say. You know, people also are very happy that some American people decide to take to defend the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. In fact, right now there is a demo in solidarity with those people that were in Washington, D.C. Uh, joint you know, in the Venezuelan embassy, joint solidarity with Venezuela. So the, there is a demo right now in the Simon Bolivar Square and also in the center of downtown Caracas. And, and, and there's a lot of people there joined, you know, happy and celebrating what the American people, some American people did in Washington, D.C. William, thank you so much. And you know, um, I love the fact it's always, I always have to hear the most serious, um, not that you're negative, but the, the worst side of the picture because, you know, we don't want to just cheer, rah, 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 and say everything's great. So it's wonderful to hear you describe it like it is and at the same time describe the spirit of the people. And so uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I think it's going to be hard to maneuver it. Uh, thank you very, very much. Do you have, do you know yet when you're coming back? Well, that's another issue, you know, that right. United States, also the, the agency of transportation in the United States who decide that no, um, there's no airplane, no airline, uh, there's no, they are not allowed any airline or air, or uh, airplane travel from the United States to Venezuela and from Venezuela to the United States. So uh, I have some, some two friends that have been here, two of my friends and friends, but they have been here for maybe four months, and they are trying to figure out how to go back to the United States. Basically, this is going to be like two of us that we want to try. Right, to right, to right. Mexico, or, 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 or. So now, since uh, Panama, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, and Costa Rica will be the most good. Uh, a common uh, you know, way to, to get in because uh, even some people tell me that they don't want to go to Colombia, they say no, we don't want to go to go to the American Republic or other countries. So basically, it's just, uh, some people are getting the, the, the ticket back 
Okay, if not, William, if not, we'll hijack. We'll hijack a plane and come and get you. Don't worry. Through Dominican Republic, okay. Okay, so we'll talk to you before then, but good luck. And thank you again, and thank you again for the great trip and keeping us all informed by bringing us to Venezuela again and again and again. It's a really an invaluable service that you provide, invaluable. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll be in Washington on Saturday and see what, what develops with that. Okay? okay All right, thanks a lot. Bye. So, Bye, we love you. Stay safe, Bye. William. Stay safe. Stay safe, Stay safe right. William. So it's really true, by the way, when everyone is, um, I know I get very excited about all the positive things I see, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and William always says, but there's this other side. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said yesterday um, is that the fact that they've been so inept, a lot of people just laugh and say, yeah, I mean, that the United States has been so inept, so the coup never happened, obviously. Everybody knows the coup never happened, right? The coup it's never so happened, that they talked yeah. about this coup that happened yeah. against the Maduro government. It was total, total bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I was getting calls from my daughter <laughs> um, saying, you know, stay away from the tear gas. You just had pneumonia. Be careful. There was no tear gas around. I mean, I was in the hotel completely safe. And William was got a little closer, and he said he could not even smell the tear gas. And... Um, the level, I just have to say a word about this, because um, the level of distortion of the media is beyond what you can imagine. I mean, Photoshop, pictures were created that did not reflect the reality, Photoshop technique. Uh, pictures that were taken a year ago were used now. Pictures that were of pro-Maduro demonstrations presented as pro-Guaido demonstrations. The fact that it was announced that Guaido was going to be, um, one, he was going to be at this Air Force base, and they were going to take over, and the military was going to turn over, leave Maduro. They had like a handful of people who turned themselves over and then ran to the Spanish embassy to hide. I mean, complete ridiculous um, realities compared to what was projected in the US media. And when you look at that, you have to say that Fidel Castro, about five years ago, I guess, when did he die? It was like about in the last year of his life, said that our biggest challenge to the progressive forces of the world is the corporate control of media mm. that controls people's minds all over the world. And that unless we can change that, it's the mm. task of challenging what people's perceptions are mm -hmm. all over the world is, you know, insurmountable. So that I uh, this I kept thinking of that when I was in Venezuela because it was uh, we put we kept putting things out on Facebook saying you know the eight of us here we're completely safe we haven't seen any sign people are going to work to school and May Day this was supposed to this was scheduled on April 30th May Day was this huge celebration that you could not believe that this is a, supposedly a country under attack. It was unbelievable, contingent after, we're gonna see shots of that, contingent after contingent. People singing, dancing, people hugging each other. Of course they hugged us all the time, you know. All kinds of people would come over and just hug us and say thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I tell you, it was hard to, let's, let's see the pictures. Let's see the pictures so that you can see they're in, in reality. So the first picture is going to be, and we have birds in the background because we're in the country here. So that's the head of the housing mission, um, who um, talked a lot and very intelligently 
about hours the and children. hours. Oh, Pardon me? For hours and hours because this was a very long meeting. I yes. And for hours and hours he'd come back. And these are two women in the hotel. The ho the, this thing took place in this major hotel. I can't remember the name of it. And these two women wanted to take a picture of me. They were uh, two Venezuelan women. I love it. Just, you know. <laughs> and everybody wanted to be with each other. This was a woman who was in the, every program started with music. Hold it, hold it a second. Every program started with music. First, indigenous music. I mean, incredible, and yeah, everybody get themselves in the best position to see. Here, Jerry, if you want to sit here. So I kept looking at this gorgeous, gorgeous baby who was part of the band that was playing the indigenous music. And I just could not take my eyes off this baby, so I finally went over to this woman afterwards and I said, do you mind taking a picture with me <laughs> and your baby? And she was one of the musicians, and her baby's there with her. And uh, each program started with indigenous music, and then it was followed by Western music. And um, both were always of the highest quality. So the indigenous music was drums and all kind of dancing, and you know, and each one would be like about 20 minutes at least, maybe longer. So every time the pro there was a new program, and then the Western music was kind of offbeat, not your standard classical, you know, Beethoven you know, uh, Bach, things like that. Much more, of, you know, Venezuelan composers, other Latin American composers. So it was a wonderful treat to always you. So that's why it was not so hard to sit there for all these hours, because it'd be music and dancing and things like that. All right, so this, this is, uh, so hold this, because I have to say a little bit. This is an area in northern, uh, north of Caracas, which had been completely destroyed by a flood, I think in 1999. And one of the things that Chavez swore that they were gonna rebuild that whole area. And they rebuilt an area that was all inclusive of all services. So it wasn't just housing, it was schools, it was uh, production facilities, all kinds of things. It was, and uh, they wanted to show us this area and the whole town came out to greet us. <laughs> it was incredible. There was dancing in the streets and music, and the, this was the nursery school, which we went to visit. And uh, all in the same area. Incredible, incredible uh, new life. You know, a whole community, a whole community. So that's part of it, so we can switch. So this was part of the celebration. You know, the mayor and everybody came out to honor us, to honor the people who had worked to build all this. And um, it was a lot of fun being there. It was really a lot of fun. And this, no, this is a commune. This is a different, this is, I, I put it in the wrong place. So uh, hold it, hold it. That picture was of a woman uh, that was working on producing pasta. I think that's pasta in uh, a commune. And um, the communes, you know, are, um, very, very much part of the building of socialism. And it's, um, we, we visited two communes. This was the agricultural commune that was producing huge quantities of tomatoes and vegetables for the whole country. And um, they actually had a big- Rabbits, rabbits, because they're short of food. And they're now producing rabbits and killing rabbits. I can't tell my grandchildren that. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> That was that. This is um, a clinic, a clinic in uh, Caracas um, that you can just walk into off the street. This is our delegation plus the doctors, and you recognize William, of course. And um, uh, they were telling us about the whole medical structure and how they provide for everybody, and so on and so on. And the one they didn't really answer. The question we kept asking was, uh, what happens to the medical, the shortages of medicine, which is definitely real and a big problem. So when they talk about the deaths as a re result of the sanctions, it has a lot to do with the medicine. They seem to manage better with food, mm -hmm. but medicines are really hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one second before we come back for a second. Uh, that was the the gentleman who's right to my right, uh, that he's from Haiti. Oh. He's studying. I mean, Venezuela has made tremendous advances yeah. in medicine under the leadership of um, um, 
of the Cubans. So um, it looked very efficient, it looked functional, everything looked right, but they did not really answer our questions about medicines. And I don't think they want to say how much they're suffering from the lack of medicine. I, I get the feeling that that's something they don't really want to talk about, and they don't want to talk about how they're getting medicine and how they're going to be producing medicine. So they have a strategy. Yeah. Um, this is a woman at the at May 1st rally. I kept looking at her because I was noticing, of course, out of just my own interest, how many, you know, we had to, um, we were sitting very close up to Maduro. Uh, William had arranged, you know, as international guests that we would be sitting there, so it was wonderful, of course. But also you had to go up, it was like bleachers and, you know, it was, it was, it was a challenge to get around and to deal with security and so on. But people were so happy and helpful. And I kept looking at this woman and uh, she came over later on to hug me and kiss me. And um, I wanted to picture her because she was so beautiful. There were a lot of older people. It was not just a youth rally by any means, all kinds of ages. Okay, next picture. So this is, I believe these are the militia. I was hoping that, um, uh, Mark would be here in time. I believe this is the militia. Now, I didn't say that there are two million people who have joined the militia. Two million people who are working with the military and are ready to defend the country. And this was a, a specific policy that was developed by Chavez and is continued by Maduro that these people are not going to let themselves be attacked and not fight back. They're already there are lots of women in the militia. They are prepared. Two million people out of a total of, I think, what is it, 20 million people, I think, in, in Venezuela. And they are being trained by the military. So this is not just a title. They actually do, uh, you know, they are prepared. They are prepared. And this is part of uh, the May 1st rally. There was contingent after contingent marching. Next one, please. So, uh, of course, you see Bolivar. There are lots of pictures of Chavez, of course, and of Simon Bolivar. And um, there they are with the red hats. Okay. And I'm not sure, Lelena and I were looking at I'm not sure what those white sticks were. The white uniform, the white contingent was primarily youth. But I'm not sure that this is youth. But it's another contingent. It was a huge, huge turnout, thousands, tens of thousands of people. Joyous, joyous. Next one. More of the same. So, uh, and the color mixture of people, it's pretty mixed. The music, I said, was, you know, consciously, obviously, uh, recognizing both indigenous music and Western music. And, uh, the combination of people of color and leadership and so on seem pretty mixed. I don't have any statistics on that. And that gives you a sense of um, how far back the demonstrators were. And yet, this isn't even the beginning of the rally. This isn't even the front. Oh this is sort of like towards the middle. I mean, you could see how huge it was. Mm. It was wonderful. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, Maduro's speech was very inspiring and very militant. Though you heard William say that people are critical of him for not, he's been cautious about not provoking the US intervention. So it's a touch and go thing. You know, on the one hand, you don't want to provoke the US. On the other hand, you don't want to uh, lose the support of the people who are furious at these right-wingers who are causing them these problems and are such, you know, out, uh, dupes, and not dupes, uh, uh, what's the word, whatever, tool, you know, doing the, the enemy's work. I mean, who these right-wingers are. And all, by the way, all the demonstrations that they have, that the right-wing has, is in the rich areas. They're not dead. That's why we didn't see them. They're in the north. You know, they go into their own little, uh, and sometimes they lie, of course, about their demonstration. So they said, when they said that um, Guaido was at the Air Force base, he was actually on a bridge nearby. He wasn't in the Air Force. 
at the Air Force thing. I mean, the stories they tell about where they are and so on, but mostly they're invariably in the rich sections. Next picture, please. So music, music, lots of wonderful music all the time. More of the march. So that is the youth, I believe. Those white flags and so on was the youth contingent. Okay, the next picture is in a park. Uh, just a park. The day uh, the rally was, let's see, I think Wednesday was May 1st, and uh, Sunday we were in the park, and people were dancing. Everybody dances in the street there, and um, we were having a lot of fun, and this woman uh, was there. I think she's came to look for us. People sought us out, too. They wanted to hear from us. Some of you know the story. I went. We went. Uh, Williams. It was actually Williams' idea. <laughs> well, he, since he's not here, I can blame him. <laughs> he um, he suggested that why don't we go and do a solidarity demonstration at the U.S. Embassy, mm -hmm. which has been that which you know they were all kicked out of, of Venezuela, so it's empty. But why don't we go and show, do a little demonstration of, you know, which we can video, and the media comes wherever we came, you know, the media was going to come. Telesur followed us around a lot. So um, why don't we go there? So we, he, he decided this at night. We were leaving on Sunday, and so we decided to do the Sunday morning. So Saturday night about 9 o'clock, William gets this great idea. Let's go get... Um, you know, oak tag and things and buy magic markers to get this and let's do a press release. <laughs> so um, I worked on the press release. Uh, the guys were doing the signs and early in the morning we got up and we were ready to go to the embassy and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. I mean, absolutely beautiful. And they have threatened, actually the Venezuelans threatened that they would take it over if the United States is, does something provocative. And one of the things they had said, that's why I'm wondering what's going to happen, was if they arrest the people at the embassy here in, in D.C. So um, we go there, and uh, some of, we were a little nervous, some of us, about going there. You know, how would they see? Is this provocative? The minute we get there, a guard comes over to us, military police, and he says, okay, so what are you doing? So we say, well, we're Americans here in solidarity with Venezuela, and we wanted to demonstrate and take pictures and do a video in front of the embassy. He says, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your solidarity. I as an individual, I really appreciate what you're doing, but my job is to check with my superiors. <laughs> so he called the superiors and we waited, and his superiors said, no go, no pictures. So um, we left there, and William suggested we go to Bolivar Park, and we get to Bolivar Park with our signs, these same signs, and immediately, media comes. <laughs> immediately. So, um, what did the signs say? And the signs say, um, no sanctions, no war, you know, in Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. All the signs were in English and Spanish. And um, uh, they came and asked us questions. So, I'm answering here, uh, and everything I say is actually taken from uh, Mumia's message that had been played at that demonstration in Washington two, um, six weeks ago, whatever it was. I don't quote him because they don't really didn't know who he was, but it, it, uh, I told people afterwards, oh, that was a really good statement. I said, it's all from Mumia. <laughs> you know? So um, that's what it is. Colonialism destroys indecent struggles all around the world. No, no to no to what the United States is trying to do in Venezuela. So the question had been that's it. We 
don't have more. So the question had been, what is your message to the people of Venezuela? And what do you think about the United States coming into Venezuela? So uh, the coup did not happen. Um, the building of socialism, the housing mission, being the eighth anniversary, and the communes. I want to say a little bit about the communes before we quit. The communes are their democratic structure. And um, every area, I mean, in lots of areas at least, have, um, they go from the bottom up. So there's a little, there's a little grouping at the bottom, then there's a larger grouping, and then a larger grouping, and then the, the structure that is responsible for the entire commune, which one of the ones we went to see was 150,000 people. Mm. So, and most of, we went to two of them. One was an agricultural one, where I, I was talking about the, the rabbits that were produced and the tomatoes, and the other one was a multifaceted commune, which we came to a meeting at night by the way, most of the work is done by the women. Incredible women's leadership at, you know, commune after another in different, different communities where women were running things, including the medical, the medical uh, center was run by a woman. So um, when they, um, what was interesting was the meeting, which I had been in agricultural communes before, but I had never been at this meeting, which was the overview for 150,000 people. So there was a night meeting, there were about maybe 40, 50 people there at most, and a few women who were presenting about the work. So what they were dealing with is how do we distribute it, the limited amount of water we have, how do we make sure that's distributed, how we do food distribution, <coughs> and all of this was with, um, what's the word for those boards that you write? On, that we use for meetings all the time. The what? I don't know if they use whiteboards. Yeah. The yeah. So they were all over. You know, that's what they were writing everything down in on oh, how to order. Multiple papers that they. Yeah. The paper they they yeah. yeah. Right. So that's what they were working with, and of course, then they, you know, welcomed us, and um, but the level of organization looked very, very impressive, mm -hmm. and very serious, and they had a lot of power you know, collective power to implement policies. So that was a very, um, you know, exciting example of how you build socialism. Mm -hmm. So between the housing conference and the communes and Maduro's speech saying, you know, again and again, and other people then saying it afterwards about how on the one hand we defend the homeland, on the other hand we build socialism and we don't stop, was very much the theme. I had not sensed this as much before on previous trips as on this with a determination to build. The other thing was um, Maduro in his speech at the end said, and we need a major rectification program. And uh, for those of us who remember the 60s and remember Mao and remember the Chinese rectification, Rectification has mixed messages and because there were so many errors that were made in the left over the years. The Pol Pot regime was a rectification. So, mm -hmm. you know, but given the culture of Venezuela and given how they, sp and how much uh, Maduro was talking about love and love of the people and so on, you'd think it was Pam Africa speaking or Ramona, um, it didn't seem like this conception of uh, rectification, but rather uh, an attempt to address what has been a perennial problem, not only in Venezuela, but all over in revolutions and societies, is the issue of corruption. And corruption has been a big issue in Venezuela because, and I know this partly from my friend Christina Schiavone, who some of you know, who um, spent a f two years in Venezuela working on food production and alternative food. She published an article, a couple of articles, I think, in Monthly Review. And, um, you know, 
she's never critical, really, of Venezuela because she's an outsider and she comes, she's careful. But when I've pushed her and said, so what is, what are people's criticisms of Maduro? Because people say he's not Chavez, he's not Chavez. Okay, he's not Chavez. But first of all, by the way, at the rally, it was clear that he had huge support. And the day after May 1st, May 2nd, this was incredible. I was looking for the picture of it. William had a picture of it. There was this big rally of the military. And they came and, I mean, the entire military structure was there and honoring Maduro. And the fact that the military has not wavered in its support of Maduro has been the major frustration for the right wing. And that was so obvious on May 1st and on May 2nd when they had this tribute to him. They were all in this position that was almost like the Kaepernick, you know, the knees, and uh, being on the knee and, and saluting the revolution. It was incredible, incredible shot. I wasn't there, but it was an incredible shot. But the question of corruption, I remember either last time or the time before when I was there, at one of the communes, I asked people, you know, about them. said, look, it's a huge problem. And it's the question of the consciousness of the people. I don't know if you got, you must remember, when we were at the airport, was somebody oh, trying yeah. <laughs> So why don't you tell the story? No. You want to tell it, Espy? <laughs> so I was with Jerry and Espy at the airport, and somebody tried to hustle us for trading money. <laughs> You know, they said, we, if we, if we're going to have to pay to leave the airport. I can't remember. Some bullshit story. And we, of course, didn't fall for it because it looked so obvious. And I remember Espy stopping and giving this guy a speech about how, what a betrayal this was for the revolution and how terrible. I mean, this guy did not expect that kind of reaction from tourists, you know. So um, it's obviously an issue. And for them to address it now in rectification, I thought was a really good sign and obviously needed. So Christina has talked about so the great things that happen at the grassroots, that developed, great plans that developed, and then somehow they don't get implemented when it goes to the higher up. So there's some corruption on the next stages. And people are making careers out of whatever. And like in everything else, those individual weaknesses and corruption. I, I was talking about the corruption of Jesse Jackson. Um, you know, I mean, we all know that, that corruption and how it works. And so even in a revolutionary society, this is something that goes on and they try. And you could see that, you know, they're really seriously trying. So rectification, addressing that, I thought it was great, a great sign. So I think there's more to come. You heard the, the scary part of what um, uh, William was saying. I'm sorry. Uh, SB, I'll give, I'll give you the report later. <laughs> and you didn't hear it either, so I don't know. I don't know your name. Angela. What is it? Angela. Angela. So, Angela, for those who want to stop for a minute, I'll give you whatever you missed. Um, um, and then why don't we take a... Uh, people can ask questions, or we can take a break until Mark comes, and we'll continue with Mark's more erudite presentation. <laughs>